just know there's, we, we've been getting a lot of questions um, through Facebook, through email, through the phones. Um, and so please, you know, let us know uh, what's on your mind and, and we can better respond. I hope everybody is signed up for our weekly ag report. Um, if you haven't done that, please go to ctgrown.gov um, and sign up for the weekly ag report. There's a link on the left-hand side. We are using that list of um, emails to distribute information in addition to our Facebook page. So um, if you're on Facebook, please um, uh, like our page. We're posting pretty regularly um, regarding um, COVID response information, but the ag report is an email that we're getting out a couple times a week. Um, we are not trying to flood anybody's inbox, but want to make sure that you have timely information um, as, as, uh, as it comes forward. Um, to this effort of, of compiling information and reaching out, oh, and Rebecca Eddy uh, has uh, gotten on the chat and has put the link um, for the Ag Report there. Um, she's very helpful and, and just a great member of the team if, if for those of you who don't know Rebecca. Um, we also have been putting together a website and updating it regularly with different information. Um, the, uh, the website is portal.ct.gov slash doag hyphen COVID. And I'm sure Rebecca will put that up on the, on the chat bar as well. Um, but we're trying to have one place for people to go to or refer other people to if they have questions um, regarding agriculture and what is and isn't permissible. Um, to that end, we're not just looking at it from um, you know, can we buy at farmers markets or not, which we will get into later, but it's also one of the things that we're trying to address is to make sure that, that farmers are recognized as farm businesses. And so we're putting our business resources up there as well. Um, and so we have information uh, about the DECD programs that have been announced, um, the SBA programs, the latest news from the Department of Revenue Services and, and the uh, IRS. Um, and also, we, this is not posted, but I have uh, had a conversation um, with Farm Credit East about making sure um, that credit is available through the farm credit system. Um, and that was a very um, positive and productive conversation. Um, so for the business resources, if you have a DECD um, Small Business Express, they've announced that they will um, uh, defer three months uh, interest in, in principal. Um, the SBA was just announced we were declared a, a disaster zone, um, and so uh, entities are eligible for small business assistance loans. Revenue services announced last week uh, a deferral on the quarterly uh, tax payments, and then uh, I believe it was last night or today, they announced a deferment on annual tax filings from uh, April 15th to July 15th. Um, and that follows what the federal government did um, with, a, with your federal taxes. Um, so that's a great place for your business questions. And, and people are asking, you know, I, uh, if I need assistance, where do I go? Um, all of that information is located on that DOAG slash um, COVID site. We're also really trying to push the marketing angle um, that our local farms, our local businesses, this is a great time to support your local community, that you can practice um, social distancing, you can practice um, uh, good, good uh, you know, health practices. I saw Don on your Facebook page, you know, one customer in the store at a time. Um, there's a lot of folks that are doing that. Um, and so we want to help make sure that people who want to support their local businesses um, have the opportunity to. So to that end, we're putting up a farm map. Um, actually, I believe the farm map is up um, right now that has all the farms, um, farm stands and farmers markets uh, and ag related businesses that are going to continue to be open. Um, thank you, Joan, in the Farm Bureau. I know you guys pushed um, the message out there to get people to respond to that. Um, that's going to be a tremendous resource. And to that end, we've, we've been um, hitting the media pretty hard. Um, I did an interview with uh, Winnie Radio out in Northeast Connecticut. I was on um, Where We Live on WNPR this morning. Um, Friday, we did a TV segment with NBC Channel 30. Um, the Connecticut Mirror has reached out, and then uh, we will be doing two visits with Lieutenant Governor Beiswitz this week to, to promote that farm stores and farm businesses are still open, and this is a great way for people 
who are immunocompromised and don't want to be in a grocery store or don't feel comfortable with um, the, how grocery stores um, are, uh, have a lot of people in them. Uh, this is a, a, an excellent way um, to understand um, that, uh, that these businesses are around um, and, and help guide them there. Um, we've also been um, talking to producers, manufacturers, and processors about implementing best practices um, in the operations, um, ensuring that, um, that you know, you're practicing social distancing um, in the workplace, that um, you know, you're, you're alternating shifts so that not everybody is uh, on the operation at the same time. Um, talking to your employees about what resources are available and what they should do if they're not feeling well. We've distributed posters. Um, and just you know, helping businesses remember that there is a role for them to play uh, as an employer through all of this. Um, and that's been very well received. Um, a couple last points um, to uh, to touch on. Um, just so everybody knows, we I've seen some comments that people aren't sure if the department is open for business. Um, Governor Lamont has been very clear that the the state will remain open for business. It may not be the same way that we've been open for business in in previous years. Um, but we are open for business. We, uh, about 95% of our uh, workforce is teleworking. Um, they're checking their voicemails um, regularly during the course of the day. They have laptops, they're responding to emails. Um, so if you have a question, please don't hesitate to reach out, whether it be Facebook, you know, you know the person you usually go to, um, or, or directly to my office uh, will respond. Um, that is critically important that we continue um, to, to do our operations. I will say this, we have scaled back the type of inspections and field visits we're doing one to, uh, to make sure that our employees are safe. We don't wanna put them um, in a dangerous uh, situation. But also we recognize that you all have a lot going on on your farm and uh, with your business. Um, and we don't want to be a nuisance through this this period. So um, we're, we're, we've really scaled back to um, the items that are statutorily either state or federally required um, that requires to be on a farm for every certain number of days or, or um, as as it is. So that is, uh, you know, that's very important um, to acknowledge. Um, I've had a number of people over the past a couple of days reach out to me regarding H-2A workers and the concern whether or not they're going to be able um, to get H-2A workers in. Um, I can tell you right now that there's not a solution to that problem, but um, this is a, a federal problem. We were actually on two phone calls with Secretary Purdue last week. Um, he is working uh, diligently with the State Department to try to find a workaround. Um, if you have an H-2A uh, issue, please contact our office. Um, we will uh, do our best to um, highlight that and get that over to our uh, federal delegation um, and make sure that they, are, um, that they are aware. I did have a call, I believe we had uh, four or five of um, the, our congressional offices um, on, a, on a conference call last Thursday to talk about this issue um, and how it will impact Connecticut agriculture. Um, so, you know, I, I think they're they're trying to work through um, a solution. They realize the timeliness of it and, and how critical it is. Um, and I, I'm hoping that we will see um, an announcement in the next couple days. Um, the other piece that I've heard uh, a lot about recently is credentials. Do I or my employees need to have credentials um, while we travel um, to conduct our business? The answer right now is no. There has been no restriction on movement, that people can go to their workplace uh, as they wish. The governor has been very clear. He is urging but not mandating that people stay home um, to, to help uh, slow the spread uh, of COVID-19. Um, should that change, there will be a credentialing system set in place um, where people can apply for credentials. Um, that will be um, announced. We're on a, a daily call um, across all agencies um, in, in the state. This is not something new for COVID. This is um, part of the emergency planning for the state has this um, uh, component involved in it. Um, but should that change, we would
um, we would message out through the Ag Report um, and our social media and our partners like the Farm Bureau um, that people should register um, in the, the appropriate way. Um, again, that has not happened yet. Um, you know, hopefully we will have flattened the curve on this um, enough um, to make sure that, um, that our, we are not overwhelming and have to increase the measures um, that we've done. Um, just so everybody's where I've been working the phones. I don't know if my eyes look as tired as they feel um, uh, right now, but we've been on the phones, uh, emailing um, almost constantly since this uh, has happened. I've been um, talking to the governor's office multiple times a day. Um, I spoke with the lieutenant governor yesterday, Congressman Larson, uh, Congressman Courtney's office, um, the governor and I have exchanged emails as well. This is, um, you know, something that we are taking very seriously and everybody understands and recognizes uh, the importance and the value of agriculture to uh, Connecticut. Uh, we, this is a great time for us to highlight um, the, the food access component of having a strong local food system. Um, but it's also important that we recognize that you are all Contributing, contributing members of the state's economy. Um, and we wanna make sure to the best of our ability as we balance public health and safety, um, that you are able to continue operations. And to that end, um, I saw a question in the chat here. Um, if you, if we, we did send out a list of essential businesses that were approved um, through the DECD guidance that was released last evening. Um, I, would, I would push you um, to that site that we broke them down into three different buckets. Um, but uh, that's, a, that's a great way to get information um, on, uh, on what is considered an essential business uh, during this period in the stay safe, stay home. Um, with that, uh, I will turn it back over to Joan. And I think, Joan, do you want me to, to, be, to answer questions now or um, wait till uh, after the other speakers? Um, let me just go over some of the other questions that were included in the chat. Um, somebody else asked, um, uh, Commissioner, how will COVID-19 impact the farm transition grant review process? When can applicants expect to hear from DOAG? So it has delayed the farm transition grant review process, um, but we actually brought it up um, with Jamie Smith, who's responsible for the program today. She and I are uh, hoping that later this week, we've already done one round of reviews. We're hoping that uh, later this week we'll be able um, to get a couple more um, uh, of, the, uh, of the applicants reviewed. And then um, that, um, uh, that we will um, plan on, I believe we said May 1st for an announcement um, regarding who, is, uh, who has been awarded a farm transition grant. Um, we're doing our best, you know, quite honestly, last week was very difficult to, to balance our normal day-to-day -day business and our, um, and the COVID response, but uh, we're hoping that this week we can get back to more of our day-to-day -day business. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Another question came in from Will O'Mara from Land for Good, and this also came up during a, a WLA a conference call this afternoon. The question is, Will urban agriculture, community farms and gardens, and food processing not for profits be explicit, explicitly named as essential? Another question came in, can you address urban agriculture and community gardens as being essential? Uh, I, I will say this, agriculture is agriculture. Where it takes place is not in statute, it's defined um, in general statutes 1-1Q, and it's the practice of agriculture, not the location. Um, and farms, farmers markets have been expressly um, put out in the guidance document. Um, it is not up to the Department of Agriculture to include something in the, in the guidance document or not include something in the guidance document. That is uh, DECD's responsibility at this point in time. And DECD has, uh, has put out an email address for individuals um, who believe their business is critical um, to be included. I would say that in, in my opinion, those answers are covered in the guidance document. Um, and, uh, and I don't think there should be a problem um, with those practices. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, two other questions. Um, I would assume that livestock 
feed supply would be essential under agriculture? Yes, feed stores were expressly in the uh, guidance document. Okay, and then another one, it is our understanding that New York State has asked horse boarding facilities to close to horse owners. Is Connecticut requiring the same or is it up to the discretion of the farm owner? I believe it is up to the discretion of the farm owner and that uh, animal care was expressly included and I'm just looking under which um, of the buckets. Uh, services including animal shelters or animal care or management including boarding, grooming, pet walking and pet sitting are uh, considered essential services. So any animal boarding would fall under that. Okay, thank you. And then another question, Will a farm get shut down if an owner comes down with COVID-19 while selling produce? Um, I don't have an answer to that. I would have to defer to public health. I would imagine that um, depending on the farm's continued operation plan, if they have employees that could manage and uh, had gone through the 14 day uh, quarantine period that, uh, that if they were doing it safely, um, that it wouldn't require a shutdown, but that would depend on the number of employees, how you have your staff arranged um, and um, where you're selling. So I think there's a, a number of contingencies to consider in there, which is again, one of the reasons why we're, we're asking uh, businesses, farmers, to have these conversations with their employees and, and to, to think about what they would do um, should somebody get sick on the farm. Okay, thank you. Another question came in, do you have any language that we can all use about safety of food and a shorter supply line? We can offer produce with lower risk of contamination, et cetera. You know, part of what we're trying to do is ensure um, that the public feels comfortable. And so I don't want to um, say anything that would disparage grocery stores or other um, uh, places that distribute food. Um, we have been highlighting that uh, for individuals who are immunocompromised, that farmers markets, farm stands, and farm stores, you know, may be a better place for them to get their groceries because there are um, operations that are um, uh, doing curbside pickup. There's, it, it is easier to limit the number of people in a smaller farm store or farm market. Um, and so we're, we're just highlighting those as opposed to um, saying that it's safer than uh, a grocery store or another place. That uh, We wanna make sure that people have access to food um, in a way that is comfortable and safe. Okay, now the questions related to SNAP um, how long should we expect to wait to have inspections for new farms to be certified to accept SNAP? Um, that's going to depend on how this, um, uh, the, the COVID outbreak continues. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are really limiting the um, amount of inspections we're doing and trying to reduce the risk to um, our employees for being out on farms. But also we wanna limit you know, them as potential vector points, um, given that they could visit multiple operations in a day, we wouldn't want them to be trans, uh, transmitting during the course of their work. Um, so if you have specific questions like that, please send them into our office and uh, you know, Jamie and I will probably have to go through and see if there's a way to um, expedite uh, farmers, uh, farmers markets um, that, uh, that were certified in years past. Okay, a couple of other questions and then I think we'll turn it over to Clark as long as all of you are going to stay on the, uh, on the call. Um, again, related to equine, our equine uh, farms are asking, is it acceptable to have uh, horse owners visit the farms? Um, it's unclear whether horse boarding being permitted permits all the services we offer or just specifically providing the horses hay water. Can you speak to allowing owners to come ride and train? So again, I think it's, it's the horse owners that are concerned as to whether they can allow the owners of their boarders to visit the farm and take place on activities on the farm versus 
just uh, caring for the livestock to keep the livestock healthy? Yeah, I, I believe the answer to that is yes, um, that uh, that the owners can come um, ride and, and, and care for their animals. Um, the the reality is, though, that if, if I am the owner of the, the stable, um, I'm going to want to implement safe practices. And so you might, you, you should, I shouldn't say might, you should um, put in protocols that limit the number of people that are on site on the, at this facility at one time. Um, Im implement um, uh, safe practices so that, uh, you know, uh, common areas, doorknobs, um, areas that are high touch, high traffic are wiped down between visits. Um, we are now at a point where COVID-19 is in every county. Um, and so if you have people traveling, you know, there's, there's a higher risk that, um, that they've been exposed or could expose people in your operation. So I would say um, that it would, be, um, it would be in your best interest to implement um, some new procedures and also to inform your uh, customers and the horse owners uh, what you're doing and why you're doing it. Okay, again, a couple of more questions came in reiterating the urban agriculture uh, concern, making sure that urban agriculture community gardens are all covered um, under this essential um, category. Can you just speak one more time, Commissioner, to the concern and also the, the urban communities and the um, people of color who are concerned um, that they're going to be treated fairly in any of the interpretations of farming, agriculture, related to urban and community gardens? Mm -hmm. So uh, a farm is a farm, as I mentioned before. Um, if, if people are being harassed um, on their way to or from uh, a, a, a farm operation, whether it be a farm stand, um, a, a nonprofit that is providing food for people in the community, um, that's a, that's a direction matter. Um, that should be brought up with uh, your, your first selectman or, or mayor, uh, your local council. Um, but that is not, um, that's not something that we can prevent in, um, in the, the guidance document. Um, and, and again, we're trying to promote and, and um, publicize that there are a lot of categories um, within agriculture that allow people to move to and from their, their farm operation. Um, and so if people would like any more specifics, um, DECD uh, released the email, as I mentioned earlier, that allows um, individual organizations to request to be designated essential if they don't feel that the guidance document cover it. I I'll repeat what I said earlier. I believe the guidance doc does cover those organizations. Okay, um, some, a question came in. I'm gonna take this one question and turn it over to Clark and then we can continue questions after we've heard from Clark and Bonnie and we'll open it up to the floor. Regarding uh, food safety guidelines, uh, one of our participants asked, are there food safety guidelines or will there be public health inspections for farmers markets or farms that have opted for curbside pickup or limited customers in the farm store? So we are in the process of developing um, some best practices to distribute. Um, we haven't gotten into the conversation with um, the Department of Public Health on um, food uh, inspections or, uh, or local health inspectors um, inspections and visits. Um, that, you know, I think we can continue, we can continue the conversation on, um, but we are looking to get some best practices out there. Um, it should be noted though that um, COVID-19 um, has, has not been proven or has been identified to have spread through food. Um, so, uh, you know, it is a relatively safe transaction. That being said, we should put in place, put in practices in place like wearing gloves, having the farmer at the market or the employee at the market handle the produce and not let customers come in and touch, you know, four or five different pieces before they choose the one they want. Um, the, the farmer uh, or employee should, you know, bag the, um, uh, bag the um, produce for the customer. Things like that that reduce the community spread um, are important and we're hopeful to get that guidance out uh, this week. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, at this point, uh, will you be willing to stay on for the duration of this meeting so I can turn it over to Clark? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner. So I with agree. that, I'd like to turn it over to Clark Chapin, uh, State Executive Director for the Farm Service Agency. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Joan, for uh, hosting this, and thanks to you, uh, Don and Tracy, for including USDA's Farm Service Agency this evening. Uh, first and foremost, uh, USDA continues to be committed to providing our programs and services to Connecticut farmers. Uh, like every other business, we've had to make adjustments and have found it uh, to be difficult and ever changing uh, as to the best balance to protect the delivery of our services with the safety of not only uh, our producers and uh, borrowers on our loan side, but for our, our employees as well. Um, the Farm Service Agency has about 20 employees in Connecticut uh, located in the state office in Tolland, as well as the five uh, service centers across the state. Uh, right now we've gone to, uh, well, I'm pleased to say that all uh, service centers are still open and operating. Uh, we've gone to a limited staff uh, in those service centers. Uh, there are certain records and files in there that we keep in there and uh, we're not allowed to take them out because of the uh, personally identifiable information that's in there. So uh, we do have limited staff still working in our offices uh, while the rest uh, telework. Uh, one of the things that um, we've had to do over the last couple of days is uh, to safeguard both Connecticut farmers as well as our employees is prohibit people from entering our service centers. That was a tough decision, uh, but uh, that's how it stands today. But that doesn't mean that we're not uh, willing to do appointments by the phone uh, if there's any reason to do a farm visit, we'll still do those. Uh, if you are to invite uh, an FSA employee into uh, your house or your office or your barn, they might prefer to do it outside and they should, as the commissioner mentioned, that social distancing is a big part in, uh, what we're, and what we're all getting used to and how to uh, fight back in this particular case. So. We are operating differently uh, than we have been. Uh, please call your local service center if you have any questions or any business to conduct with them. Uh, phones should be answered and it, obviously somebody may be on one phone and there's always voicemail capability. So if anybody doesn't get back to you uh, timely, please let me know and I'll make sure that you do get an answer. Um, and Really, I just ask everybody to be patient. Uh, it's kind of a crazy time. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud to work in the agricultural community in Connecticut. Uh, we collaborate so well, all of us on this call, uh, Yukon Extension, uh, the Connecticut Department of Ag and Farm Bureau, Farm Service Agency, my sister agencies as well, Rural Development, and uh, who, of course, is located in two of our service centers, as well as NRCS. So we're all working, uh, trying to accommodate everyone to the best of our abilities, and we appreciate your patience. Thank you, Joan. Okay, um, thank you, Clark. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bonnie Burr, who is UConn Extension. I just wanna remind everybody that this meeting is being recorded and it will be uploaded onto the Zoom cloud to be available later on. Um, all of the chats and all the information on the chats will also be available. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bonnie before we open it up for questions. Go ahead, Bonnie. Great, thanks so much, Joan. First of all, again, I want to express a lot of thanks to Farm Bureau and to our sister partners uh, who really did a lot of work in pulling this together in such short notice. There have been so many questions, and again, Commissioner, we want to thank you for, for showing the leadership, again, with, with the governor and DECD and public health uh, to really help to start to get us on the right track. I think one of the things that we looked at really quickly with UConn Extension was putting together a COVID-19 uh, um, 
a list of best practices, all sorts of things that we've got listed up on our Yukon Extension website. Uh, many of you know Stacy Stearns. Uh, Stacy is responsible for all of our social media and making sure that uh, people get the information that they need. Uh, so if you go to uh, Extension, uh, there's Stacy right now putting up the link to our source. Uh, really, really important. We've been putting up uh, links to all sorts of information. Uh, not only are we duplicating what Commissioner puts up, uh, but also what USDA has as well as uh, some of our partner land grant universities to, to showcase what they're doing. Uh, folks that are a little bit further ahead in this, in this uh, pandemic than we are, uh, again, just some really valuable resources. Uh, we've got a number of our extension educators on the, the call tonight, our specialists that, that can help answer some of your questions. Indu, who handles food safety, I see has been adding up comments. Uh, so again, if you've got any questions at all uh, related to where we're gonna be with extension, uh, just just give us a give us a call. Our offices again. We're checking email on a regular basis. Like the Department of Agriculture, we've been asked to telework. Uh, so if you go to our offices, you won't find us. But know that we are working every day uh, from remote locations. So we're answering email. We're answering your calls. Uh, we're more than happy to video chat with you. We're more than happy to Skype with you. Uh, if you've got issues or challenges on your farms. Uh, again, that, that may not warrant a face-to-face -face meeting if social distancing is going to be an issue. Uh, certainly, we're, we're all pretty capable with what we can do with cell phones and iPads. So, Joan, I'll turn it back to you, and we're happy to answer questions as they come through. Okay, Bonnie, thank you, Commissioner, uh, especially Clark, thank you so much. So, at this point in time, I would like to open up the meeting to questions for anybody that's already presented here. We have right now 232 participants in our meeting. So I will ask you to unmute yourself and ask questions of anybody that's uh, present in the meeting. Commissioner, I did receive a, a, a couple of inquiries. People are concerned about people, customers coming into their food establishments with these um, uh, reusable bags that have not been sanitized or disinfected. Um, is there any guidance coming out on any of that? Um, we will include it in our guidance. Um, that was, uh, that's been one of the um, questions that has come up more frequently now that we have definition uh, and clarity that farmers markets, farm stands uh, and farms are all considered essential businesses. That was, you know, the first big victory now we'll, we'll go into the implementing of uh, the best practices. So that's, uh, I, I wrote that down as one of our issues to, uh, to include. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Um, I'd like to also continue to open it up to questions. You can unmute yourself. Ah, there we go. Um, this is probably going to sound like a trivial question. In the past, we have had our customers buy online and we swap tote bags. However, now everything is 10 cents a bag for paper bags. Can we get a dispensation so we don't have to charge our customers a ridiculous 10 cents? I think, I think it's clear to them what you mean. If we're putting pickup product into a paper bag, do we have to charge them for the bag? Uh, it's my understanding that only non-reusable plastic bags um, we're required to have the 10 cent fee that, uh, okay. that any other um, bags, it's the individual operations uh, decision whether or not to charge their, um, their customers for them. Okay, so that's, that's not state law. Okay. I, I would, again, you know, as to the previous question, you know, um, reusable bags is something we, we should address in, in guidance later this week, just to make sure that um, we're not using a bag that may have been contaminated. Are there additional um, questions? I'll give you a few minutes to figure out how to unmute yourselves. Um, I see somebody has raised a question here. I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, yes, I would like to know where we can access this information that you talked about tonight. 
Yeah. So um, if you go to our website, um, we have set up a specific COVID um, page, portal.ct.gov, P-O-R-T-A-L dot C-T dot gov. Hey, hey, could, could, you, could you say that slower? Yep. Portal. Ready. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. P-O-R-T-A-L dot C-T Portal dot C-T dot gov. Dot gov. Slash. C-O-V dash. G-O-V. Yeah, portal dot C-T dot gov slash DOAG, D-O-A-G. Dash DOAG, yes. Hyphen COVID. Yes. C-O-V-I-D. And Joan, if, if you could help um, push that site and the, and the Ag Report um, uh, subscription or uh, enrollment through the, through the CFBA channel, I think that would be, that'd be helpful too. Yes, absolutely. We will continue to share any information that comes out of Department of Agriculture, Farm Service Agency, or UConn. We have also on the Farm Bureau website uh, put a link for a COVID informational page for farmers, and we will uh, make sure that this information that has been provided this evening is uploaded onto that web page. And that's going to be on what? The Farm Bureau? Yes www.cfba.org. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Right on the home page, you'll see a link for uh, coronavirus resources for farmers, and that will take you to a web page where we are uploading all of the shared information. All right, thank you. You are welcome. Um, any other questions? Questions? Oh, just say, and again, if you want to pull the information, all the information that we've got on uh, the Yukon Extension website, uh, there's there's many many pages available, uh, not only for agriculture but for for uh, information if you're looking to do things with your kids. There's information on food safety. There's information on food insecurity. Uh, we've got all sorts of areas covered uh, for for Yukon Extension. Thank you very much, Bonnie Burr from UConn Extension. Does anybody have any other questions? I have a short question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Um, I, actually, one of your staff on the chat has been helping me with this as well, but I just wanted to ask the commissioner, for folks that are um, selling food, produce, either through a farm stand or um, you know, delivering baskets of food, et cetera, to folks who are shut in and, um, and um, autoimmune compromised, et cetera. It, do you feel it's safe for us to use language such as feel free to let this basket of vegetables sit for 24 hours, at which point the COVID-19 will no longer be active or a threat to you? Do we know anything about how long, even if we unknowingly contaminate the food. I mean, we're wearing gloves, none of our staff are sick, et cetera, but we're still delivering food. Can we provide some reassuring language like I just described? Um, I would, that, that's a, a, an excellent question. Um, I, I would let us look and see if CDC or FDA has any recommended language to use. Um, I wouldn't wanna use, um, any sort of language or, or make any, any sort of statement that doesn't, um, that hadn't been vetted through, um, you know, essentially the scientific or medical community. Um, Cause I want to make sure that we are all um, practicing the, the, the same or implementing the same pro, uh, protocol. So let me see, um, but we can, uh, you know, that can be part of the guidance that we released this week. That would be very helpful, thank you. Because I think, I'm, I'm convinced that UPS is telling us, you know, just let your package sit for 24 hours and anything that's on the cardboard will be gone. Does it stand for food as well and worth knowing for all of us? Um, hi, this is Indu, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can, Indu, thank you for joining us. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention, Stephanie had been uh, talking to me on the chat in the side, but- um, Thank you, Indu, it was very helpful. Yeah, no, uh, you're, you're very welcome. I just want to add uh, regarding the UPS telling about the cardboard, 
there was a recent study which said that this coronavirus potentially could survive on cardboard for 24 hours. And that's why they, the UPS is suggesting that. Um, similarly, the same study had said um, that the coronavirus could also survive in plastic and steel, which is you know common in hospitals. And that's why that's probably the spread has been so uh, fast in hospitals. But the amount of data available is not confirmatory. So it's all, like the commissioner suggested, you cannot probably make an assumption that yes, after 24 hours, it's not going to be there. Um, I, would, I wouldn't recommend putting out a statement like that. Although this virus is not known to be foodborne, there is no data available that says it is foodborne and it would stay on, on produce. Hmm. But um, that is something definitely to consider um, at this point. Hope that helps with the question. Uh, Hindu, and that, Hindu, helps, this is, that helps very much. And if there is any new information about that, both both Indu and, and Commissioner, we'd be most welcome, most most happy to to, to read that. Hey, Indu, yes. this is Bonnie. Could we could we could we certainly uh, encourage all of the people purchasing produce to wash their produce after they get it home? Absolutely, but I think washing their hands would be more critical uh, sure. since this is a respiratory virus. You know, person to person mm -hmm. spread has been known to be the current cause of the pandemic. So um, I think the most effective way is wash your hands and definitely wash your produce after you go home if you think it might have been contaminated. Um, in addition, I would also think that um, the elderly people should avoid. Uh, eating raw produce at this point, just mm -hmm. to be safer since they are a high risk group, but definitely washing, washing would help. I hope that answers it. Um, thank you, Indu. Could you just, um, for those of you that don't know you, just uh, very quickly introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. So I'm uh, Indu Padya. I'm the food safety extension educator at UConn, and we have put forth we have tried to work together with the other Yukon Extension team and put forth a variety of resources for uh, food safety at the Yukon Extension blog site. Please feel free to, and also please feel free to reach out to me or any of us at Yukon Extension. Like Bonnie said, we are here to help and we, we are trying to put in updated information um, just uh, so that we can put information from the Connecticut uh, government website as well. We're trying to uh -huh. get them together. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Indu. Uh, do we have any other uh, additional call uh, questions? Yeah, I just have one quick question. Um, if assuming that things don't, we hope they will. But if things don't change very much by the time our farmers markets start opening, um, is there any way that the uh, somebody, the Department of Ag or whatever, would be able to help uh, those of us who would be at the farmers markets? Uh, to have access to these N95 masks. Um, hospitals can get them, doctors can get them, nurses can get them. Uh, farmers don't get them. <laughs> and if we decide that that's a good idea for the people working at the farmer's market who are the farmers, uh, if there's some way that there would be a source of those for us, we don't need a lot of them, but we need something. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And um, we've been... Um, on our on our daily calls with uh, the state emergency operations uh, command center, there have been explicit calls and requests for um, PPE, personal protective equipment, um, the the masks, um, face shields, um, scrubs. We would have to really see where we are um, with um, where the the COVID nineteen. Um, is and how uh, it is spreading and what other measures we could put in place. And, and the reason why I'm, I'm very hesitant to say anything affirmative um, is that over the past three weeks, as the state has made their requests um, for PPE um, to the federal government, due to the amount of requests and the need and the lack of um, of uh, supplies, we have only received 14% of what has been requested. Um, and so the medical community 
um, does not have um, uh, enough supplies to handle um, the influx in the, in the coming surge um, into the healthcare uh, system. Um, so I think if we're at a point um, that other people need um, masks that we're going to have some other significant problems um, to be facing. So I would say we let's let's take it where it is um, right now. You know, one of the reasons why we're reducing um, some of our inspections is because we have a limited supply of, of uh, PPE to use for our employees, um, and we want to you know make them last as as long as they can. Um, that's a, it's a, it's a great question and it's a, you know, very forward thinking, uh, and looking, but I would want to make sure that we have, um, the healthcare professions, um, uh, take as, uh, have as much as they need to, um, uh, to care for all those that have entered the, the healthcare system. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there um, any other questions for anybody on the call? Uh, the Commissioner of Agriculture, Clark Chapin from Farm Service Agency, Bonnie Burr from Extension, uh, myself, uh, Executive Director, Connecticut Farm Bureau. Um, I have a question, if I may. Um, I, I, I'm um, Virginia from Blueberry Hill Organic Farm. We participate and have for a number of years at the, you know, with the Carbon Tree Farmers Market, which is a very big market. We usually get between three and 6,000 customers on a Sunday. Um, do we see a possibility of the Farmers Market not even being held this year? I would um, say that I think if we're going to try to do business as we did last year, um, that's not a fair expectation. That if there are ways to um, limit the size of gatherings, and again, this can be you know part of our our guidance as we get in you know further into the market season, um, everybody should take that uh, take those precautions. Um, I didn't mention earlier, but this is a, as good as time as any. We did um, it in one of our latest ag reports push out um, online ordering platforms that farmers could consider to use so that people can place an order in advance of the market <coughs> or coming to the stand um, to assist with a curbside pickup. I think those are good practices that everybody should be looking into at this point. Okay, I'm having great success with that. I mean, my local community members are just excited about getting food, you know, from local farms. So that's been great. I right. guess at this point, there's a good possibility that that market will not be held this season. Am I right? I, I wouldn't say that. I would say okay. that there, there's an opportunity um, to, to look at how the market can operate given the current restrictions on uh, the size of gatherings. Okay. Thank you. I, I have a question. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, I've been listening to everything you said this evening, and I represent a group of Connecticut barn owners who have hunter-jumper boarding facilities, and we rely on our income from lessons, training, showing, and boarding. And what the commissioner said tonight is sort of in direct adverse violation of what the governor said we had to do. In closing down our barns, I, I closed my barn down at eight o'clock tonight. There are no borders allowed, no lessons allowed, etc. Now, what the commissioner has said in his guidelines via vis a vis does not say that. So I've already, and as have my colleagues, sent all of our clients emails and whatnot that our barns are closed, they can't come on the property per Governor Lamont's guidelines. Now, what you're saying totally contradicts that. I, I'm, I'd apologize for any confusion, but boarding is expressly included in the guidance document that DECD released last night. That John, I'll, there's a question in the chat. Is the Farm Bureau working with Farm Credit for any plan in case any farmers have issues paying mortgages? Um, I'd like to take a, an opportunity to address that. I spoke with Farm Credit East um, late last week asking that they follow the state's 
um, lead and deferring loan and principal payments um, for the uh, stoppage in um, businesses. Um, they are not at this point in time, or they weren't at the time that uh, we had the conversation um, going to put out an announcement. But Keith did assure me um, that if individual farmers are having problems, Farm Credit East uh, has yes. um, credit extension available and, uh, and the ability um, to work with individual farmers. Um, and so I would really strongly encourage anybody that uh, is going to have difficulty um, with uh, their farm credit loan to get in touch with their loan officer as soon as they possibly can. Um, that is um, something that, um, that Keith wanted, uh, wanted me to feel uh, comfortable with. Um, I'm glad that Farm Credit is taking that approach with their customers. I think that's the right approach, not just um, for them as a business, but for the entire agricultural community as a whole. Um, and so, um, you know, I hope that answers that question. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, with your permission, I did share your email address to those individuals that uh, we were requesting it for further communication with you. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have additional questions from anyone in the meeting? Please unmute yourself. Um, do we have any additional questions? I guess I will just say this. This is the first time in a year that nobody's asked me about hemp. <laughs> I think hemp is the least of everybody's problems right now. Um, I do, um, well, before we uh, wrap this meeting up, I would like to open it up to the participants in the call. Uh, as we all know, farmers are a compassionate a uh, group of individuals and when push comes to shove in good times and bad times, we all step up to help one another. So I'd be interested to hear whether um, anybody has a particular need on their farm other than what we've heard this evening and or if individuals feel that they have something that they could contribute that will help to um, for anybody that's on the call or on the meeting. Um, uh, GVI, we're working um, in, in communication with some other urban ag organizations to create guidelines around, because we have so many shared tools at our community gardens, we're really concerned about um, how many folks are touching a given surface, and I understand that that's a concern for a lot of us who can't um, maybe do, you know, car side deliveries, or, um, although I'm really proud of the folks who are navigating and doing that. Um, so we will, we can definitely make that available to people as we create guidelines around sharing tools, disinfecting, washing, sanitizing, and kind of following um, the best case scenarios for fighting COVID as it comes out from our researchers. Thank you so much for sharing that, Ellie. Um, before we wrap this meeting up, um, are there any other uh, resources out there that folks on the call would like to share with other farmers on the call? Um, okay, um, hearing none of what I would like to do is I deeply, deeply appreciate the time. Uh, and they got shut down. Because this guy somebody, didn't have the answers. And everybody in the group's like laughing. Um, okay. I'm going to be wrapping this meeting up, so uh, I would like to personally thank the Commissioner of Agriculture for the time he spent with us this evening. Um, we really appreciate it, Commissioner, and um, hopefully folks can find some time to follow up with you with their individual questions. We appreciate all the work that the department has been doing and the agency to share resources. I'd like to thank Clark Chapin with Farm Service Agency. I'm sure as more time, more information comes out of USDA, you'll be sharing with that and uh, can't say enough good things about our friends at Yukon Extension with all of the expertise that they have in helping with food safety um, and all of the other questions that you have been posting. Um, we have, I hope that you have found this meeting to be beneficial. 
uh, first time we've ever done this, but it, it seems like it worked well for people. Um, I think maybe in the future, if we feel that things have changed with COVID-19 and we would like to host this again, uh, we will be sure to let everybody know about another virtual meeting. In the meantime, I would ask that everybody please stay safe and healthy. And we deeply appreciate the time that you joined Connecticut Farm Bureau and all of us this evening. Thank you so very much. And have a, a safe and healthy um, evening. Enjoy time with your family and the family pets who really like to have you around right now. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. What did they tell you? COVID-19? What?